This is the Take 5 Podcast. Today's topic is top five obscure bands. All right, Dustin, what you got for number five? Well, for me, this is uh, not not all of mine are necessarily obscure bands, but some of them are bands that just maybe don't get talked about as much or forgotten about. People may know who they were and go, oh, okay, yeah, I've heard about that band 30, 40 years. And uh, this was the band that kind of prompted me last week to come up with this overall topic idea. It was a Black Oak, Arkansas. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember them? Yeah, it's funny because um, I was going through my stuff, like Jim Dandy popped up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. that was actually kind of close to being on my list because I, I, I like Jim Dandy. Yeah. Um, you know, they had a, a run of records. Uh, Tommy Aldridge was in that band for a while. Yeah. Um, before he wanted to like Pat Travers and then Tazi and White Snake and all that, but he was uh, I think he was even still maybe in his late teens when he got in that band and toured with them. Um, and I've always had heard too that uh, a lot of uh, David Lee Roth yeah. took a lot of influence. That's what I was going to the- say. Yeah. 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 His um, stage presence and stuff was supposed to be. Um, yeah, influenced by yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. So yeah, that was my number five, and it kind of started me with the idea of this uh, with Black Oak, Arkansas. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I said I came close because I said like I seen Jim Dandy on there. I'm like, you know, I was like, is that obscure enough? But, but you know, like we said earlier, to us, a lot of the bands we talk about seem like they're huge. But then when we ask somebody else, you know, the casual fan, like Zodiac Mind Wolf, for for an example. You know, yeah, absolutely. I thought they were, would be like a big band, but then you ask random people, nobody's ever heard of. Them. Yeah. So I kind of try to go kind of deep on mine. Okay. So my number five, I've kind of mentioned this band before, but there is little to no information on them. The band's called Gregory's Fun House. Don't know of Gregory's Fun House. I knew there was an LA band. It's yeah, called this, Funhouse. Yeah, this band is from um like New York. Okay. They um they were kind of like a, a parody band, like a poppy goth <laughs> rock. Okay. Make, um real bassy vocals, like even sings kind of slow, but they're like tongue in cheek, you know, like Okay. Um but they only have 13 monthly listeners on Spotify. I'm surprised they even had a so I'm on Spotify because I said because there's zero on them on the internet, but I ran into their CDs on um at Magnolia's record okay. square in Columbus and kind of caught my eye and it's like it's different and it's really hard to explain. Almost like the singer for um Crash Test Dummies. Okay. With like the like, less folky, I guess. I don't know. It's yeah. they're, they're weird. All right. What do you got for number four? Uh, number four, this band, I would consider ab- actually obscure. Um, and actually, an early on, what we would now refer to as like a super group. And I don't think they were ever like marketed as a super group. I believe they were only around for maybe two, three years at the most. I know they did one album, possibly two. But uh, the band was called Saint Paradise, and it was uh, Derek Saint Holmes and Rob Grange from just had left Ted Nugent Band, you know, or whatever happened with that. And the drummer was Denny Carmasi, who was in Montrose and then played with Sammy Hagar's solo stuff too, and went on went on to play with Heart in the eighties. So, like I said, I don't ever think that was considered a super group back then. It was seventy nine or eighty whenever this came out um but had two you know guys from ted nugent's band and then you know drummer from montrose and did some of the sammy hagar stuff um derek st holmes did vocals in that um which i think he's has a hugely underrated voice you know um and a lot of people don't even know 
that Derek St. Holmes does vocals on most of the classic Ted Nugent songs. Oh, yeah. 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 A lot of people don't even know that. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the band was called St. Paradise. Yeah. I don't think I know them. Yeah. I know they did, like I said, one album. I saw a, uh, I've seen on YouTube before them playing at like, I want to say it was one of the like 79 or 80, like day on the green fest. It was in Oakland. Um, they played a set at that, that I know was, I've seen on YouTube before. Right on. Is that it for yours? Yeah. 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 Okay. St. Paradise. Okay. Number four. Right on. All right. My number four is, well, they were an American glam industrial band formed in 1994 called Psychotica. Okay. Um, the singer, it's funny because I was, um, when we first started doing the show, this band came to my mind. I wanted to, um, I was going to message them and see if he'd come on the show and come to find out he passed away within the last year. Okay. But um, they have like 649 monthly listeners on Spotify. But I seen them open for Tool. Then I also seen them open for, it'll be, it's one of my, um, Honorable mentions, but um, they opened up for the impotent sea snakes. Yeah, yeah. And there was like ten people at that show, man. And that's um, I thought they were really good, but for some reason they never caught on. And you know, that was around the time when like Marilyn Manson was big, and you know, the kind I'm of pretty sure I do recognize that name. They were on Lollapalooza yeah. the year Metallica okay. and Ramones played. Okay, but yeah, like they they never caught on. Right, yeah. Number three. Number three is a uh, a band that I've actually known about for the past like fifteen years ish. Um, they were a part of that early eighties uh, new wave of British heavy metal. Um, this band they they did two albums on Atlantic Records, uh, Warhead and Blood and Thunder. The band was called More. I had a feeling you were going to say that. I got the Warhead. Yeah. Okay. And uh the singer was the original singer, Paul Mario Day, I believe his name was, is um for Iron Maiden. Damn, so I didn't know that. Yeah, like from what I read, like the first say and then you know, a few other singers came until they came upon Paul, Paul Diano, then you know, to Dickinson, etc. But uh yeah, I like those two albums too. I've liked them for like I said about the past fifteen years. Uh, real, you know, new wave or British heavy metal ish. Um, good stuff, man. More they were too, they were on Atlantic Records. Yeah, it's funny because as soon as you talk about early 80s and new wave British metal, I'm thinking I'm basically gonna say more because, yeah, because I, I have the vinyl, the um, forehead. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, my number three was an alternative rap metal band from L.A. that first formed in 1988 after being discovered by Madonna and signed to Maverick Records. They released their only studio album, Downtown Circus Gang, in 1993. They're like one of the earliest rap metal bands, Proper Grounds. Man, I don't remember them. Yeah. 54 listeners on Spotify. Now, they got the song called Jezebel. They had a music video for it. Okay. And it's, um, it's kind of a sample of um, Talking Head song. Um, Once in a Lifetime, I think was, it is. But it's, yeah. it's a good fucking song. Even Shane sweat that song. And it's, was uh, it on Maverick Records? That, was, that wasn't that Madonna's label? Yeah. Maverick? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, it's who discovered it. But like it wasn't that was a band like um, I remember seeing the video and went and bought the CD. Then it was like then anytime after that I'd go to the store or, or go to like the record store and their CDs were marked down to like a dollar and shit because it totally flopped. But like there's some there's some good jams on there. But like um, in the early nineties I I went through the whole like rap metal phase and I have a couple on my list that um that early 90s rap metal stuff. All right, what would you have for number oh. two? Number two, my number two was a band I just discovered within the past few weeks. 
Um, and I assumed when I discovered them that they were a newer band, but they've been doing stuff since 95. They've actually put out a good handful of albums. Um, they kind of found their niche like in the blues scene, but I think they sound like a rock, a bluesy rock and roll band to me. And they're also from Toledo, our Ohio. We're from Toledo called a five horse Johnson. The singer does a lot of uh, harmonica stuff with like one of the original like microphones that kind of looked like was used back in the 50s. Um, oh, yeah. I said, surprised to find out they had like a good number of recordings they even put out. I said, none of, none of them, I don't believe, were any sort of like well known labels necessarily, but um, that they it, had been doing stuff as far back as 95. Yeah. Um, good stuff. I was all about it, man. You know, five horse Johnson. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of harm bluesy harmonica stuff, but still what I felt like, you know, was just rock and roll, man. Oh yeah. All right. My number two American metal crossover band. From Florida, formed in 1994 by members of the Collapsing Lungs. Band name is acronym for Losers Usually Never Get Signed. Ten yeah. monthly listeners, Lungs. <laughs> yeah. You you remember them, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, they were Absolutely. like a rap metal also. Yeah. Like, dude, they, yeah. I remember, um, you know, because when I was living in Florida, they, they were, I think they were from like Jacksonville or something, but um, okay. they, they were yeah. kind of like a local band. But I remember they mm -hmm. opened up for House of Pain and an, and some unknown band called Limp Biscuit at that time. Yeah. And I went to well, that I show. Had... And I remember I... Limp Biscuit and Lungs both like blew me away, man. Yeah. I had saw Collapsing Lungs with Biohazard a few times. Damn. Yeah. And That's Collapsing awesome. Lungs, like you just said, was even what turned into Lungs ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's and I um I seen lungs a couple times. The other time I seen him was um with an honorable mention, which was the dime store hoods. Okay, yeah. Remember that? And yeah. um they also played with my number one, which I'll get to. Okay. All right, so I like I, that lungs record, man. Oh yeah, it's they only put yeah. out that one. It's so yep. good, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, was good, man. I got a few of the songs are escaping me right now. One, one of them, like Lucky 13, something oh, it's like that. 13, yeah. It's 13, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was an interest, in, interesting record, man, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was good. All right, what'd you have for number one? My number one is a band that has, has been mentioned before. Um, they did one album. We're only around maybe two years ish, I think. Mid eighties from New York. Uh, Sweet Pain. Sweet Pain was um, a lot of people have heard me talk about on here. Uh, Nineteen eighty five Road Dog, Mike Corsione. He ended up doing a book that recently had come out called Tales from the Gutter. Um, he did vocals in this band, um, and Kelly Nichols played bass in this band. Kelly Nichols went on out to Los Angeles, was briefly in an early version of Faster Pussycat, and then went to L.A. Guns. Um, the story that Mike Corsiano has always talked about is he, at the time, worked for Combat Records. And the owner of, or someone high up from Combat Records, wanted, because at the time, Combat was only doing like metal and thrash bands. Um, wanted to put out a record from like a glam rock band. So he told, you know, Mike Corsian, like, why don't you, you, you know, a lot of these guys from these bands here in New York, why don't you put a band together? And he's like, I don't, I don't, I'm not a band guy. So he ended up do, putting this band together and did vocals. And uh, like I said, they, they did one record. Um, I don't even think they ever toured. They played a handful of shows like in New York, the New York area. Um, but one of the songs that was on that record was uh, Shoot for Thrills. 
that Kelly Nichols took with him to LA Guns and was on the first LA Guns album. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's one of these records that for a while there I heard, you know, was like would sell, you know, high dollar on eBay or Discogs, something, you know, people would seek out. Um, but yeah, man, Sweet Pain, my number one. Oh, yeah. All right. My number one was American rock band from formed in 1988 from Bakersville, California. They were kind of a goth industrial type, but they kind of went more new metal on their later records. Cradle of Thorns. Yeah. Yep. Remember them? Yes. Because I would always get them confused with uh, Crown of Thorns. Yeah. Or now Cradle of Filth, yeah, like yeah, or Cradle, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's like um, I saw them with um, Lungs and Dime Store Hoods, um, like they changed their style, yeah. Like their um, their earlier stuff that said they had a had two vocalists, like um, one and one was a female, and they just okay. said it was real real gothy. But then, like, yeah. and the later stuff, like. She left and they became more of like the corn style. But like I mean all their stuff is good, but yeah, the early like goth stuff, man, it's sick, dude. Oh yeah. So good. Yeah, I've definitely heard the name, probably heard him and probably just, you know, didn't recognize, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. They only have two hundred and thirty one listeners on Spotify. Okay. This list is kind of hard because I mean, I have so many, like, um, so many of them, and I didn't know what to put in my top five. So I put in the ones I like, I listen to the most, I guess. Okay. I, um, I got a few. All right. You go yeah. ahead and run through your honorable mentions. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just kind of go through them as I have them written down. Um, Girl with, uh, Phil Lewis and oh, Phil Collin yeah. before he went to Death Leopard and, Phil Lewis ended up in LA Guns and similar to Sweet Pain uh, the song Hollywood Tease which is also on the first LA Guns record was a song from Girl yeah. and Girl was early 80s uh, kind of known over in Europe and even in Japan but never really hit in the US um, and yeah Phil Lewis, Phil Collin went on to LA Guns and Def Leppard um, another band I have is, was from New York uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and I'm pretty sure one of these guys ended up in the band Monster Magnet. Um, this band Blitzphere. Oh, yeah, I saw them at Guar. Yeah. Okay, yeah, damn, I forgot about that band. That's crazy, exactly. And that's what yeah. that's kind of what, what I wanted this yeah. idea for this topic yeah. to be. Is yeah, a band, you know, oh shit, I haven't heard that in 30 years. Yeah, yeah, thought about that band, you know, yeah. Um, so Blitzbeer, uh, a lot of people, you know, the, I think this would be another name, a lot of people, Brownsville Station. Um, you know, Smoking in the Boys Room was a yeah. Brownsville Station song. Um, Buster Brown, a band called Buster Brown from Australia. I know which that had, name. Yeah. That band had Phil Rudd playing drums before he went to ACDC and Angry Anderson before he went on to Rose Tattoo. Nice. Ended up finding out, kind of digging into each of these bands. That in the 87-ish, there was a band from Kentucky, a hair metal band called Buster Brown, who actually did a cover song of this Australian Buster Brown. Damn. Well, then that might be the one. I mean, I know I heard one of, but that yeah, might be the yeah. one I heard. Um, so Buster Brown, I got Cactus. Cactus was a band that uh, Carmen Apsey played drums in, and I think it was after Vanilla Fudge. It was early 70s, and I remember that band name because Gary Sunshine brought them up on the episode we did with him last year. Um, so Cactus, you know... Uh, Carmine Apsey band. Uh, another band I got, Coney Hatch. Oh yeah. Okay, you you know who? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know them. I yep. saw. I'd say you know within the past year or something, I saw that band name 
was on a fly, like a show bill or whatever. I want to say with like ACDC or Ted Nugent. And I saw this band named Coney Hatch and I'm like, who's this? Like went and checked them out Yeah, from Canada early, like late seventies, early eighties. Mm-hmm. So you know who, who that was? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, another one, this band was from the UK, uh, trapeze. Yeah. Um, had Glenn Hughes, yep, I know them um, who went on to deep purple and a lot of other things. Uh, the drummer from uh, ended up playing for a while at uh, Holland, Dave or Doug, Dave Holland, <laughs> um, to Judas Priest. Played drums for Judas Priest from like 79 to like 89. Yeah. Um, another band that uh, Chris Gates had told me about this band and a conversation I had with him once of I had asked him who were some of the bands that he was into or he thought should have, you know, maybe made it or whatever um, from that LA scene back in the late eighties. And this band isn't at all a hair band or anything of that sort uh, little Kings. And they had an album come out on epitaph in 89 um, kind of punk, but kind of its own thing, kind of unique. Uh, little, I've never little, heard of but I, I've heard you talk about them before. Yeah. And the, uh, the cover, the artwork cover of that album they did on uh, Epitaph is uh, one of Mad Mark Rude's drawings or paintings. He was a uh, an artist out of that, that same scene. Um, another band I got, Cherry Bombs. Yeah. B-O-M-B-Z. Yeah. They were from the UK. It was uh, Nasty Suicide and Andy McCoy from H- Hanoi Rocks. Um, and they had a female singer. Um, and it looks like, well, shit, I've gone through them all. The last band I had was, uh, I had mentioned this band, Three Man Army, because this, that band Good Is Gone that I've talked about before did a cover of one of this Three Man Army band song called Polecat Woman. And so that's how I even, you know, led me down to discover that the, who they were, Three Man Army, uh, another, like European band from somewhere over in Europe. Uh, I don't know if they were, I remember if they were like 70s or early 80s, but uh, yeah, so those are the uh, the honorable mentions that I ended up with. That's cool because uh, we didn't have any doubles. I'm surprised. Okay. All right. Um, I'll go through mine. All right. I had Peppermint Creeps, which is a uh, oh, yeah. over the top glam band from. Hollywood. Yeah. I think they were as um, Pretty Boy Floyd for a while. Okay. I, the drummer, I think it was the drummer, was the main guy, and he passed away, so they pretty much called it quits after that. Super, super glam, man, like bright colors. Yeah. But, I mean, they're, the music's kind of fast. It's almost punk sounding, but it's just over the top, man. Yeah. Then um, I have, there's two bands with the same name. The art, there's one, there's an Australian alternative glam band. And then there's um, a German punk band, both called The Art. Okay. The, um, the alternative band, I saw them with Faster Pussycat about 10 years ago. They they were really good. They're just, you know, they're, I mean, they're kind of glam, but just kind of rock and rollish, I guess. And then I had um, a Belgian hardcore punk band, Nations on Fire. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Remember them. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, and I had another rap metal band called 96 Decibel Freaks. I want to say I vaguely remember that name. Okay. Then I had um, this band sound a lot like Metallica. And I would, uh, when, the Black Album came out. I told them this was the new album instead of the Black Album. A version. Yeah. Remember that remember band, that album fit to be tied to sound like Metallic? I was telling people that was Metallic's new album instead of the Black Album. Okay. It was yeah. And I'm not big into thrash, but I thought it was a great record. Um, this band I've mentioned before, Slave Raider. I don't remember them. They dress like pirates and shit. 
Yeah, I remember you saying that now. Yeah. yeah. Um, you probably know this band. They're they're thrashy. Blood Feast. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I would always get them confused with Blood Fest. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I remember Blood Feast. Yeah. And um, Haunted Garage, which I mentioned them before, they're like a uh, shock rock. Okay. Yeah, and I don't then, think I knew them. Um. Here's a band. I don't know if you've heard them, but you might like them. They're kind of Guns N' Roses sounding. Crisis Party. No, no idea. Who you gotta is. check them out. I think you would like them. Like, okay. I think they came out in the late '80s, but they kind of had a Guns N' Roses style. Oh yeah. Um, Cyclone Temple. Oh yeah, yeah. Another thrash yep. band. Yeah. Yep. From Chicago area. Yeah. yeah. Then I had. Um, this is. They're just kind of an alternative rock band, but the Dancing Hoods. I don't think I know that one, though. No. Um, Dead Flyboy, kind of a groove I, metal band. Yeah, yeah, remember I think, them. Yeah. I think I mentioned them before. Um, Gut Shot. Maybe I vaguely remember that name, maybe. They're, they, um, they're rap metal. I think they're from Canada. They put out one record that was pretty good. Um, then a band called Kevlar. Okay. Have you heard them? I don't think so, no. Yeah, uh, no. I think they're from Pennsylvania. They got a female singer. I've seen them with like Skid Row. I've seen them with like, um, like LA Guns or something, I think. Um, and here's one. I think we've discussed this band before. Formed in Cleveland. But uh, they were one of the most promising bands on the Sunset Strip while winning the Ben Gazzari Star Award for being the top draw band in Los Angeles. Legs up. Yeah, yeah. Remember, you remember them, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I remember seeing them um, open for Dirty Looks. Okay, yeah, we've talked Al about that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, they were great. Like, um, they came, like, all they had was, like, a demo cassette. I don't think they ever really released anything after that. Yeah, I think a collection of their demo stuff was released within the past few years. On, yeah, re yeah, recently. Yeah, a re-release thing, yeah. 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 But they, they're they good to kind of remind me of, like, um, his voice almost reminded me of, like, Blackie Lawless. Kind of like an LA gun style, I'd say. Yeah, legs up. I definitely remember them. Yeah, that's good shit, man. Yeah, that's a band like um they should have they should have been a lot bigger, but they came out in the nineties, so it was, you know, yeah. their time was past. All right. Album of the week. You're up. Well, this album uh came out. April of 1987. Um, I knew the couple of songs they did end up doing music videos for, uh, Love Removal Machine and Wildflower. And it really wasn't until probably the summer of 90 when I was in Texas for a few weeks that my cousin's girlfriend had this cassette in her, uh, I think she had a Trans Am, <laughs> um, The Cult Electric. Um, God damn, man. Fucking amazing album. Uh, we both talked about, you know, The Cult was one of those bands who uh, sound kind of changes here and there, album to album. But uh, <clears throat> this was so here's what I found out about this album. Uh, when they went to record it, um, it was originally going to be called Peace. And they were working with another producer who I, I don't remember who it was. And for whatever reason, it wasn't working out, I guess, with that producer to where they got uh, in touch with Rick Rubin. So Rick Rubin came in to produce this album, and that's where the very dry sound, almost dry, like ACDC sonically kind of come from kind of zeppelinish almost um i like sonic temple after that and a few songs but this song is just good all the way through this album i'm sorry 
this album all the way through, you know, open up, you know, with Wildflower, uh, Peace Dog, one of my favorite songs on it, uh, Little Devil, Electric Ocean, um, probably my favorite song on it is the King Contrary Man song. Yeah, that was one of my ideas. Um, to me, that the, the production on this record is one of the best ever. Like, yeah. the guitar, guitar tone is so fucking good, man. Like, I remember um, I kind of got into the cult. Like, I started getting to it a little bit before this. I remember seeing um, Revolution off of the Love record on Headbangers Ball. Okay, that was yep. my first introduction to them. I'm like, oh, that's kind of, I mean, that's like kind of different. I mean, because it shouldn't have been on yeah. Headbangers Ball because, you know, they were like an alternative goth band at that time, almost like a U2. But I was like, you know, it kind of caught my attention because it was different. But I remember um, seeing the Love Removal Machine video. Yep. And even that's not like one of the, like the heaviest songs on the record. You know, it's, but it's still a great song. And I was like, man, you know, like a lot yeah. more like distorted guitars and stuff. And um, I remember I bought this cassette the same day as I bought um, Beastie Boys License to Ill. Okay. Yeah. And... <laughs> And I remember I gave license to my sister because, like, man, this, I didn't realize it was rap, you know. Like, yeah. I, I knew uh, no people are um, fight for your right. And I was like, oh, this shit sucks. But then I remember I rocked the fuck out of electric, man. It was like, yeah, I remember walking through the neighborhood in my boombox, man, and blasting that shit. And I was like, man, it was so good. Yeah, like I couldn't believe how you know how different it was than the earlier stuff. But yeah, and, some of my uh, favorite songs is King Contrary Man is fucking amazing. And yeah. I had Electric Ocean, Little Devil, Peace Dog, Wildflower. Yeah. Man, those are Memphis Hip Shake. Yeah. The cover like, of uh, Born to Be Wild. Yeah, even that's good. And that song played yeah. out. Yeah. Yep. Um, and for this tour, the touring they did on this album. They had a touring bass player because the bass player that played on the album played second guitar during the touring. And the bass player was a guy called Kid Chaos, who had come from a band you already mentioned earlier, Zodiac Mind Warp. <clears throat> After the touring for this album, this Kid Chaos had then... uh started working with Rick Rubin to put together his own band, had changed his name from Kid Chaos to Haggis, and put together the Four Horsemen. So there's there's a lot of tie-ins with yeah. this album and uh you know a lot of other bands from around that time, 87, 88. Ian Asbury, he sang on a um Circus of Power song. Yeah, yeah. And, um, it was on some of that uh, Four Horsemen records. Yeah. Rocking is yeah. my business, doing backup vocals. Yeah. Then he um, sang for the Doors for a short minute. So yeah, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's got a great voice, unique voice too, man. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, when you... you Billy Duffy had played guitar, yeah. Yeah, like you, when you hear him, you know it's Ian Asper. You know absolutely, yep. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Ten years ago, they um, they toured and did uh, that album all the way through. Fuck, I didn't. Yeah, that yeah, would have been. That would have been sick. Yeah, I, I I really hadn't come full circle yet back to rock and roll. But if that was to come around now, I'd be all about seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I seen them yeah. one time on the Sonic Temple tour. I mean, they, they did some of those or stuff, but, but I also like Sonic Temple record. But like I like yeah seen them, I did too, uh, like I like to have seen them you know that album all the way through yeah. yeah, a lot of the later stuff I um I didn't like as much, like everything after Sonic Temple kind of went downhill for me. Sure, you know, but yeah, like Electric is fucking amazing. Yeah, um, it's a classic record for. Like you've heard me refer to, you know, the real motherfuckers. It's it's a classic record. Oh yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because when you know people think of the cult, they'll think of like Firewoman or maybe like um, right. He's still Sanctuary Wait, or something. Sister. 
Yeah, she's Al Sanctuary. Yeah, Sweet Soul Sister. Yeah, yeah, because um, yeah, those still get airplay, but this album. Yep. Yeah. You know, maybe Love Removal Machine, maybe, maybe. Wild Flower. Yeah, maybe. yeah, because yeah, they had. I remember um, Electric Ocean. I think was even in a movie. Okay. I um, I remember watching them. And, oh, holy shit! You know, like um, I don't know yeah. what movie it was, but yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I just listened to this again over the weekend, you know, because, you know, that that was my pick for the, you know, album of the and week. Me too. I was like, because I was yeah. going through picking my favorite songs, and it was like, I think I picked like the first four songs. It like it's going through, and like this is it, this is it, because it's so good, man. Like, yeah, like I said, yeah, I just love the guitar in it, man. Yeah, fucking amazing. Yep, that was all. You know, Rick Rubin wanted to, or you know. Give them that sound. Yeah. So, yeah, that's all I got, man. All right, that's all I got, too. Yeah. All right. Comment below if you know if you've ever heard any of these bands. Yeah. Or Here's some bands think. that. Yeah. Or that some we, that we didn't that, mention. Yeah. But, see if. Like I know. said, like I. You know, like some bands that I think is popular come to find out nobody knows who they are so i'm curious yeah. to see what people think you know yeah. or vice versa yeah you know? exactly yeah. yeah 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 always welcome people's comments for sure yeah all right thanks for watching five and out five and out